Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are and whenever you are. Welcome to the Community Live Stream, the show that helps you be a more effective ServiceNow administrator and developer by bringing you content from our community and not only bringing you the answers, but the thought process, the journey of discovery, the exploration that goes on behind those answers so that you can employ those in your daily job. And as I said, be a more effective ServiceNow administrator and developer. My name is Chuck Tomasi from ServiceNow. I have been with ServiceNow for coming up on nine years in various roles. I was a customer for a couple of years before that. And what, that makes over 10 years of experience. So I think I'm qualified to bring you a tip or two on, on a topic or two today as we go through this. Let's get through the pre-roll. This is the first show of the week, so let's make sure that you are going to YouTube and subscribing to the channel. If you haven't done that already, appreciate it very much. Turn on your notifications and you will get something that looks like that, that says, hey, now community is now streaming live. So this is the community live stream. You'll get the notifications when you get there. Good morning, Meg Newsill. If you are watching live, thank you very much. Give me a shout out. Let me know where you're from. How's the weather? It's pretty cold here in Phoenix. I mean, cold as in down to freezing. That doesn't happen often. And when it does, it's usually around the Christmas and New Year holiday, not mid-February. This is when we're supposed to be warming up and I can work outside, but that's not happening. We're a little late with spring in this area. So crazy weather patterns. I blame El Nino. It's officially here. <laughs> Enough about the weather. Make sure you subscribe to that. If you find something useful in the next hour or so, something helpful, maybe mildly entertaining, click that like button so that other people know that it is there and you found this useful. If you're watching this on the community because these videos are posted back to the community, I'll get that URL in just a second. Click the helpful link so that other people know this was helpful. Good morning, Ashish. Is this related just to the development part of anal or analytics as well? I My specialty is in custom applications, the platform and integration. So a lot of the answers that I provide are around development. I am not real big into performance analytics. I've touched with it a little bit. I know some stuff about it, but that's not my area of expertise. I have heard other colleagues rumblings from similar uh, positions in the company who are interested in starting uh, a stream similar to this. So perhaps in the future, we'll have more on ITSM or ITOM or CMDB or reporting and analytics, you never know. I'm not gonna stop them. I encourage more information sharing. That's what the community is all about. Greetings, Jay from Chicago. Hope Chicago is finally warming up. Don't forget, we also do this on Twitch. There's the URL there. Twitch keeps them around for a couple of weeks. You, uh, excuse me, YouTube archives them indefinitely. If you have more than just a good morning or a quick shout out, be sure to go over to the community at community.servicenow.com over there. And that is what you see in the screen behind me. That's where all of this happens. The, the reason I encourage you to post your ServiceNow questions, your issues, your questions to the community is because that's where we're going to find them. It's easier to search. That's, that's what it boils down to. It's easier to search. People can find it in, in years later. I've got questions out there that have been out there for 10 years. And yes, they are still out there. We've gone through a couple of different platforms on the community software. The content is still there. If you post them here in the in the in the chat, uh, it's gonna be hard to search for it in ten years unless somebody just happens to stumble across it. Uh, it's it's not gonna be something you can just quick Google in and pfft, there it is. But who knows what technology YouTube will have in ten years? More Daniel. There is a PA office hour every two weeks on Wednesday. Very good to know. If we've got a URL, let's, uh, you can't throw URLs into the chat, but uh, I, I know that there was some other, like I said, other people are, are talking about this. It, apparently, <laughs> this great, grand experiment for the last 14 months or so is starting to work. I like it. I like it a lot. So if you've got opportunities like that, let's share those. What comes after the community? Uh, if you are new to the community, let's get the, the right keys on there. Here are some basic ground rules you might want to observe while you're on the community. Things like posting one question per post, make sure you get it into the right forum so that you get the right eyeballs on it. Uh, general stuff like that. I'm not going to read it all to you. It, first of all, search. 
search first because there's often a question. I can't tell you how many times I see somebody ask a question and they get an ans a link to the same question as the answer. So, you know, it, it's a bit of here, let me Google that for you. And maybe you have searched before. Doesn't hurt to put in, hey, I searched, I couldn't find anything. That happens to me all the time. And then somebody else comes up and their search foo is a little bit better than mine. I'm willing to acknowledge that and say, hey, thanks for the answer. I don't know why I didn't see this, but good morning, John. Good morning, Ashish. Good morning to everybody. If you've been on the community for a while, consider turning some of those common questions and answers into blog contents, video, whatever, it, and, and share those. That It makes it makes your content a lot more scalable, for one. Um, I, I just read up on something that a coworker of mine, Sush, wrote on Record Watcher. Perhaps we'll talk about that in the show, if not today, maybe this week. We did a lot of development over the weekend and learned a few more lessons. And you know me, when I learn something, I want to share it with you. So there are a couple of things in the wings. If we if we start to run thin on content, on, on the open questions and answers that we find, uh, put it into a blog article so that you can reference that and link to it and other people can reference it. Because otherwise I would have to go to Sush or look at some obscure document and go, what is this? He gave a nice walkthrough step-by-step -step on that. Again, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Good morning, Christopher. Starting this year's Fanatics Inc. ServiceNow Admin Developer. Good job. Hey, new role. Exciting to hear about it. We also have the developer site, which I didn't switch to the right tab, developer.servicenow.com. Go get yourself a free personal developer instance. It is provided to you free of charge. Of course, it does go to sleep after a time. So keep using it and you won't have any problem. There are occasional maintenance periods, but uh, those are, I think, patches once a month, maybe, to get to the next patch level. Uh, you can get yourself a new Madrid instance. So Madrid is the current release that you see. Uh, it goes on that banner somewhere behind me. API documentation for all the scripting APIs, free learning plans. If you are new to ServiceNow or you want to learn more about being a ServiceNow developer, this is the place to go to get all of that wonderful free content. Meetups and other events under the events, the share portal, lots of code snippets, applications. I post things there from time to time, a place to kind of an open marketplace. There's no, no money involved, money exchanged in any of this but you can find that on the share portal. The events, as I mentioned, you can find meetups that are coming up. We've got lots and lots of them coming up at the end of February and March. If you want to join or register for one of those, go over to meetup.com where you can see where the local chapters are in your area. If there isn't one in your area, reach out to us. We'll help get you one started. We are not here to run that for you, just provide you with content and the tools to help you organize that and create that community in your own local geography so that you can talk with other developers. We are working on one for Phoenix. I just talked to Mike Stockman last night. I said, I have a topic we might want to talk about that you might find interesting. And uh, hopefully I'll get a chance to show you what, what I was tinkering with this weekend on this episode. So go over there to the developer site. We also have other events over at servicenow.com slash events.html. So if you're looking for those ServiceNow user groups, aka snugs, if you're looking for the, uh, what's it called? Future of work seminars that are coming around geographically. There's several of them in Asia, Southeast Asia, a, a, uh, NZ is is coming up. I, I don't know the exact locations, but if you go to this page, you can suss out where that information is. So that is the other events. We also have knowledge coming up. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this every day. May 5th through 9th, 5th and 6th, our pre-conference training where you can get three days of training in just two days for half price. So if you're looking for that next level of education that you want in ServiceNow, you can get that at the pre-con training and then roll right into the conference the 7th, 8th, and 9th, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays when that happens. Don't forget to check that checkbox that says, I want to go to CreatorCon too. It enables you to go to the CreatorCon sessions and the CreatorCon keynote. That is the developer content that is going to be at Knowledge, special sessions just for CreatorCon. Now, you don't have to be a code monkey to go to CreatorCon. We have a new track this year for the builders in your organizations, people who are 
creating solutions out of Excel spreadsheets or Microsoft Access or whatever they're doing, we want to help show them what a valuable development platform for no coders that you could do on ServiceNow. So encourage those people in your organization to take a look as well. We're creating eight new workshops, hands-on workshops, and lots and lots of sessions for the builders in your organization, for those no coders to create that, to get those applications, get the value. Most of you that are watching probably already know, hey, ServiceNow is a great platform for building solutions work together with the no coders so that you can be creating say the service portal widgets that they put on a service portal you can create the flow designer actions that they use on a flow designer or the integration hub spokes that they use into their integrations lots of great partnerships so that we can maximize the value in an organization and it's a lot of cool stuff but that's that's where we're going with the future you're going to hear that messaging a lot at uh, about the platform and the power of the platform and the speed of that at knowledge and examples of that and hands-on. Don't forget to bring your business cards, networking. I know I've said this all every day, but every day I think it's something a little different and knowledge is where you want to be. We also have the Customer Success Center. Just a quick reminder, no matter where you are on your ServiceNow journey, whether you are just starting out and want to know how to maximize your value, what does this long uh, journey look like from starting to implement ITSM or HR or CSM, and then getting into custom applications, CMDB, 50 best practices out there, more coming all the time. And don't forget to look for the Success Navigator. Very cool new feature, I'll answer a few questions, and it will give you prescriptive information, guidance on how you can execute this journey. Wonderful, wonderful information on the Success Center. All the code that we do, Oh, excuse me, the webinar, the webinar Tuesday, the 26th, we're going to be talking about the Madrid platform features, a packed hour of information all about Madrid and what's coming up in that release. So I encourage you to register if you haven't already. There's a link below. Sign up. It's going to be great. There's a ton of information and much, a lot of it, not much, a lot of it will spill over into our March, April even the June content. There won't be a Tech Now in May because we will be doing the live shows at CreatorCon at the Developer Theater. So if you are there, look forward to seeing you there. And uh, let me get a selfie with you. That's that's my goal this year is to uh, get selfies with everybody at CreatorCon. It's a tough goal to get. <laughs> I want to see you at the Tech Now webinar first. So let's, uh, any code that we have is available at the URL they see. If we write any script today, you don't have to squint at the screen and look and try to decipher what it is or where it goes. You can copy and paste it directly from the folder with today's date on that GitHub repo that you see there. So we will be using that. With that, we are done. Good morning, Carolyn Ramsport. Good morning, John. Looking forward to seeing you at, at the screen up. We are ready to go. Okay, I was just checking. There's like five places for my eyes to dart around to make sure that everything's working correctly. And yes, we have unmuted. Otherwise, everybody would say, hey, you forgot to unmute. I'm getting in the practice of running that mute. Is create those in the schedule. So under schedules i believe it's under system definition i could be wrong on this not performance analytics automated test framework system definition nope no 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 oh where is it system scheduler no schedules there they are so we have schedules under the schedule table the table name is cmn charlie mary nancy underscore schedule and we've got things like u.s holidays you could just as easily go in and create a schedule. Of course, I am in a scope. <clears throat> I needed some service portal widget information, so I loaded my good old CreatorCon 2017 meetup application. And down here are the schedule entries for what they want to do. My recommendation would be, they have start date, end date, location. They've got multiples in here. I wouldn't do that. Can anyone suggest some idea how I can create the same? Yes, I would could. I would configure one schedule to contain the holidays you want. There is an out of the box example called US holidays. 
that you can use as an example. If you don't have it, consider getting a free personal developer instance. Check it out at, at developer.servicenow.com ding to reference. Uh, once you have your schedule defined, you can use it as any other schedule. Not that big of a deal, at least in my opinion. Answer given. That's one. Onward and upward. More stuff to do. So, lots of examples. Thank you, Carolyn. Carolyn says, good morning, Chuck. Enjoyed the desk side chats. They were very fun to do with Darius. Darius was a good sport about it. Wore the bow tie and everything. <laughs> Been a lot of fun. We did three of them. One on the community. Stands to reason, right? One on the developer program, which I think was released shortly after. I can't remember which, which order they came out with. But there's a community, the developer program. So all about developer.servicenow.com. A lot of what you hear me preaching every day. And one on the platform. So building custom applications and extending existing applications. Uh, we had a good time. It was, uh, it, was, it was a totally different format. I didn't have to do any recording. It was nice showing up on someone else's uh, someone, playlist, for lack of a better word, someone else's content. Just show up as the content. Show up, talk, leave. That's nice. I don't have, to, don't have to run the cameras, don't have to write scripts, don't have to do any of that other stuff. So, uh, Jay says, Performance Analytics Office Hours is great. Go to Communities, then go to Performance Analytics and Reporting section. You'll see the next Office Hours there. All right, I am going to offer this as a community service. So, let's go to Communities. Performance Analytics and Reporting is right there under the Communities menu. <clears throat> And office hours, February 27th. So there's one coming up next Wednesday. Tom Pasek. I work with Tom. He's on my team. All right. Good for him. I'm going to reach out to him. Maybe talk to him about the option of starting something like this as, as a visual example. This, this looks great. Uh, might be tricky for, say, people in Australia. But will these events be recorded for some reason? Do, 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 do. I should... I would second recording them if possible with the company looking to I I will talk to him. 42 attending, 10 maybe. That's awesome. I like it. I like it a lot. Thank you for pointing that out. And next one we get SMS Gateway. IT Can I add a widget functionality to header menu? Let's see what they're trying to do. As I play more with Service Portal, I'm learning a little more every time. So I'd like to take a look at these, see if it's something I can help with. Hello, I've struggled with some advanced portal configuration. I can't find anything in the Google to answer these questions. I want to add a menu item to my header. However, I'd like this to not be a link to a specific site. Instead, I'd like to change the outlook on the main page. Default, there are four widgets visible. When one presses the button, four more widgets appear and press it again, and those four extra disappear. Basically, a toggle function for available widgets is as possible. To clarify, I want it to be located in the header, not as a button in a widget. Uh, yes, that's going to have to be done via um, events. Let me see if I can find a quick reference on that. So service, portal, events. There are scope and root scope events, broadcast and on. Here is an article, not saying this is the right one. Currently have two widgets. Da, 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 da. Not sure if it's a blog, but it could explain it. Let's take a look at the blog. I knew there was a blog. How to communicate widgets in service portal. There we go. Good article here. This is the one I was looking for. That sets things up with a widget that is doing, calls a function. So here we have ng click select pill. And then a second one. Is this Sush again? I forget who wrote this. Yes. Sush is a very smart man. So let's do this. 
you're going to need to do this via service portal events using broadcast and on handlers. Uh, Sush wrote a good article on how you can communicate between widgets. <clears throat> Let's put that right in here. And Sush wrote a good article. As a link opens in another window. I've used this before and it's pretty cool. Did I, have I done anything lately? Uh, don't know if I've done one. Let me see if I can find one that I have where the widgets are communicating with each other. The, I know where one is. It's the app that I wrote to do the history portion of the podcast that I do each week. So on my, on this day in history portal, there is a widget. So when I add a date, well, let's start next week's podcast a little early. This is going to be airing on the 27th. This little spinner down here that you saw right there, if I go into this screen, I'm going to make it a little smaller so I can see all my widgets on there. I've got a list of birthdays where I'm going to pick some random birthdays. We'll just pick a few there, go back. And when I regenerate, watch, there's a little spinner that shows up down here on the bottom. That spinner is actually there, but hidden. And it unhides based on an event. So when I do this, or I save it back to the record, or I post it to Google Calendar, which I'm not going to do right now, that little widget just appears and disappears as sort of a, hey, I'm working here. Because some of these operations, like posting a Google Calendar, they took you know, a few seconds. And when you're sitting there waiting and you're not sure what's happening, you can always put a message at the end that says, hey, I posted to Google Calendar. If it's happening asynchronously, that's a little weird. So in the widget, let me go to on this day. And I'll just bring up studio. Yeah, there it is. On this day, service portal. I don't know if I have a service portal. There it is. And I look at the widgets. One widget is communicating. Let's get me my OTD. I got to remember which ones these are. The details, the count. I have an OTD spinner. We'll start with the little spinner. It's a very, very simple widget. The secret is in the client script. Waiting for it to load. So while we're waiting, we take a drink. There we are. There's no server code. There's not even any CSS. So let's put those away. <clears throat> and the HTML simply says, if show spinner, which is a Boolean, then it's going to do everything in the inside of this div, which is really show this spinner. It's a font awesome icon that naturally spins. I don't do anything to animate it. So I just print this character and you get this from font awesome, font awesome.com. And I noticed that they, they are, they have a lot of icons out here. If you look just for icons, you will find a lot of icons that don't work in Service Portal because Service Portal, I believe, is using the version 4 Font Awesome icons. So I go to, what is it, fontawesome.com. Here, I search for Font Awesome version 4. I think it's 4.7. And down here, you will see there's version 3.2.1, version 4.7.0, bootstrap cheat sheets. And under here are icons and I simply well I'm not going to google for you but you get the idea look at stay with the version 3 or version 4 font awesome icons and you'd be good there's also a series of glyphs like glyph dash this and that that you could possibly use anyway back to the key point this simply says show spinner is false so when this widget is displayed this widget is on the page the first time through it will not run it will say don't show this and this root scope, there's scope and there's root scope, okay? Scope is this widget. Root scope is the whole page. So you can communicate between widgets by posting these. This on is a listener. It says, hey, 
listen to any other widget. If anybody in the page broadcasts this show spinner, then run this function. Okay, and it's going to say, should I show or not? And it's simply going to set this show spinner, which is up here, and if it does, it shows it and it turns it off at another point. So who is controlling that? There is another widget called OTD, I believe it's details, has one in it. And in his script, it, where is the, that's not it. Got to find it. Not the details. I got to get, it's been a while since I looked at this page. So OTD, was it count? I think it was the count page. I tried using Record Watch, but it didn't work. Uh, that's not it. Those are the count widgets that go across the top. I have lots of widgets on this page. I should probably just take a look at the page. Wouldn't that help? Widget. Oh, TD somewhere I'm going to find. You know, I could also find it this way. <laughs> I could search in oops, Service Portal Widgets and look for anything where the client, the field on the widget is called client controller. The field in the widget editor is called client script. So just one of those weird things. Who's got anything that mentions spinner? New page, output, and spinner. So let's take a look at output. We'll look at it in this way. Who's controlling the spinner? Down in the, scroll, 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 this code gets parameter, just data that it's going to publish on the screen. The client controller says, all right, when we load this page, when we load this widget, turn off the spinner. I don't need it. It's not on. So it broadcasts to the root scope. And remember, the other one is root scope dot on. I think that one might actually should be a scope dot on. Susha outlines this in his article, when you should use root scope and we should use scope. And I may be using it incorrectly here. but. Down here, when I write the record, you will see a broadcast. So two of them. One here, broadcast show spinner true and broadcast show spinner false. And the, this part is the data that the other one was saying, hey, what do you want me to do? I got the event. What is important about that event? So I can have this widget communicating to the other widget what it should be doing. This could be maybe a count of records, so that if I do something to one widget, it updates a little dashboard. Numerous ways you can use these to communicate between widgets. This is what you're looking for, is this broadcast and on communication using these events. You make up the event names. I would recommend using good event names so you don't accidentally start tripping other widgets that may be listening for the same event. There are plenty of examples where broadcast and on are in there. So root scope dollar broadcast, root scope dollar on to communicate. Depends how you want to do this. Again, review this wonderful article about and, and follow the examples. This actually does work. He published this a couple of years ago. Oh, man, three years ago. That's right. Service Portal came out in Helsinki in 2016. So a little bit about that. I did not use those this weekend. Now I'm starting to think maybe I could or should. I'm, I'm trying to think of a use case. Let's see. Good morning, Steve. Good to see you. I'm glad you're here. Did I ring the bell on that one? Or put in a coin? I don't remember. Let's move on. Refresh the screen. Wow, we got a lot out of that. Put that away. We don't need that instance. Go back to the community. Hey, there's something in the mailbox. Let's keep the discussion moving along. Into the inbox. Need to find a new schedule. So Rad comes back. The question was originally asked by Snow at Das. And I said, a schedule to work well. This article has steps to find creating holidays. I was going to put in a URL. I did not do that. I should have done that. But anyway, keep that up there. Down to the unreplied section. What do we have? Service portal chat volume. There's a volume. 
We're considering to add chat as an intake type. Oh, <laughs> I was thinking of like audio volume, <laughs> like the notification might be too loud. Uh, we're as an intake type currently limited to email call and alert and are looking for community feedback. If you're using the chat feature currently, can you share how this feature is impacted or redistributing intake volumes? This looks like more of a community feedback. How is it done? I would like to subscribe to that to find out more about it. See how people are doing with chat. Uh, my understanding is it is a great way for agents to work on multiple things as opposed to one phone call at a time. You could time slice. I don't know if you've ever been on a uh, call with customer support via chat, but it always takes a little longer than you think for them to respond. It's probably because they're working multiple chat conversations at the same time. You could have people that are capable of working five conversations in parallel uh, and or some new people that maybe only be able to handle one. And if I remember right, <clears throat> Madrid has a feature that, uh, what's it called? A advanced assignment, Assi advanced work assignment. That's what it is. I'll be talking about this on the 26th. And advanced work assignment allows you to, uh, it's, it's sort of like smart distribution rules. So you can tell what type of intake should go to which type of groups and people and to, you know, be able to do some of that smarter load balancing to say, Chuck's got 10 years of experience. He can handle five chat conversations at once. So load him up. If, if he's not at five and a chat comes in and this is his type of category and whatnot, assign it to him. Put it in his queue. If there's somebody new that's just starting, maybe you only load him up with one. So you can do that with advanced work assignment. All right, I gave you a little sneak peek into what's coming. So... I didn't really provide any answer on that, but I did subscribe, so I want a Mario coin. <laughs> Let's refresh this. What else is happening? Unreply. Let's keep going with a few more new ones. Retain info message from record producer in Portal. Hi. I have a record producer which generates an info message. The information message is present after submit and the user is redirected to the generated record when on the back end. However, in the portal, I can see the message appear, but when we are redirected to the requested item, the message disappears. Is there any way to keep that info message on the screen? I'm currently using the method where I've created a message record and then calling it. Not sure if that would work for portal or not. This is the code I'm using. He's doing a gs.add info message. There is a way to make static messages. I don't know if you've seen them before. Um, I believe they're called UI notifications that stay on the screen. You've probably seen this like when you're loading an update set or something and it says, hey, there's, there's this blue message that stays up there and it's a different color blue that it's not the green or the, the pink. Uh, let's see what we can find. Do a little research here. Let's search the Madrid docs, since that's our latest release. And I'm sure everybody will be on there in a week. <laughs> UI notifications. UI notification. Configuring notification trigger. No, that's not it. Let's take a look in the community then. So I don't want that. Let's go to... Somebody wrote this, and I can't remember what it was about or who did it. But there is there's a way to do those, triggering you and I don't know how to display message with UI notifications. Let's find out. Hopefully I have a screenshot that will help illustrate my point. I want to display UI notification to respective people based on incident status. Da, 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 da. They are the kind that actually have to go away. Yes, I want status back. Configure a new notification in the catalog item table, put a condition like state changes to approval in the notification body. This is not a UI notification. This is an email notification. Not what I was looking for. Uh, agent workspace, Geneva, what are some shortcuts? Announcement differences. Hmm. Notification with sys override. Maybe if we just look in Notification. I'm going to have to do a little back-end research on this. System web services notification, push, announcement, push notification. No, those are all email notifications. 
Item designer. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. That's not what I'm looking for. Okay, I'm going to put a note here to look for info on UI notifications for whatever reason. My fingers don't want to type that. And once I have that info, I will post it back. So, bummer on that one. Retaining info message, we just did that one. You know what, I'm gonna also take a subscription on that one. Subscribe to that so if anybody does contribute, that might lead us in the right direction sooner and then I don't have to do my research if somebody gets the answer to them. Hide cancel state for high priority incident. That should be easy enough. Hide cancel state for P1, P2 incidents. Cancel option should be available to select only for incident management group service desk. Cancel option can be made available P3 incidents only. Please help me on the same. Go to the UI cancel button action and put condition there. It's not the cancel button, it can the cancel choice in the state field. What can I give? Okay. I got a two-part recommendation. Some people would do this in one. A client script with the conditions you have. However, you need. However, I find that client scripts are going to have hard-coded societies in them for the groups you want. For that reason, I recommend doing it this way. I have such an aversion to hard-coded societies, especially in client scripts, that you don't know if the group has the same society in dev as it does in prod. If you've cloned, sure it does, but if you've done an import, it doesn't. So stay away from them, make your code easier to read, uh, first, create a display business rule. Check the advanced checkbox and then set the when field to display. In the script, add something like this to determine if when the cancel option should be visible. Note this code has not been tested. You will need to make adjustments. Fingers are working pretty good this morning. I'm kind of surprised. You will need to make adjustments as necessary and is provided without any express warranty. So the JavaScript I'm talking about is going to look like this. Um, do display business rules do the on execute in there? That's a good question. Let's find out. So go to the business rules, system, definition, business rules right there in front of my face. I can click it, click new, pick your favorite table. And check the advanced button. The advanced tab comes up and in the script it says, come on, finish loading. It is on execute rule. Okay, good. In there would be our display cancel equals true. Uh, our group name equals current dot assignment group dot get display value. So I'm not above spending a few extra variables to make this a little readier. Read, readier. That's a new word. <laughs> and it said, if it's one of those two groups, var priority equals current dot get value priority, 
we can say if priority equals one or priority equals two, then they want to turn this off. Display cancel equals false. All right, let's make it readable, easy to read. You could put a lot of this into a client script again, but you don't have current and you don't have get display value. If group name equals whatever it was in their organization, group one or group name equals group two, then turn it back on. You know what? I am also all about the curly braces. This is just a really hard place to edit. Bah. Okay. Display cancel equals true. Sounded similar to the rules. Now, what do you do with that is pass this information to the client script and say, G scratch pad dot display cancel equals display cancel. Just pass it over in the scratch pad. Make that a little smaller. I promised that I would write that, so we did write code today, hooray. Let's bring up my code editor so that I can save that for you and post it to GitHub later. Yeah, thanks, I don't need release notes on what's new in 131. Close that, close that, don't save that, don't save that. New post done. Okay, that's part one. Hello, there we go. Part two is a client script that reacts to the G scratch pad value. This would look like this. Unload if G scratch pad dot, what did I call it? Display cancel, <laughs> hardest part about not using studio. <laughs> what are my variable names? Display cancel if Actually, if it doesn't display cancel, doesn't want you to display cancel, then use gform dot remove option state. I gotta look at the docs. Where's the API? The API docs are out here in glide form. That's the actual API name for the client script G form stuff. Fix my mouse so it doesn't fall off the table. Version mismatch. Sure, go to Madrid. Glide form has remove, 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 remove option, field name and choice value. So you can say whatever it is, six, five, three, three, four, whatever adjust to your state value for canceled. That's it. Keep the client script simple. You could even put in, you know what? Note, G script, be nice to your future self, is set by a display business rule. All right, put little comments in there to help you determine what is this? Where is it set? What's the connection between these? You put, put in the business rule. This is going to be used by. All right. I forgot to copy that one too. Bling. New. Save. Done. All right, that was fun. The the straightforward brute force approach by a lot of people is let's go into your script, let's do the whatever, the on change or the on load or whatever, and put in gform.get value assignment group, 
and then determine, is it this society or that society? It's like, if you start, <laughs> the minute you start putting things in quotes, yellow flags should go up. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's my general policy is how can I get away from not quoting literal strings? Whether it's a message on a notification, a, U, a GS info, ad info message, or there's lots of ways around that to make it translatable later and to avoid getting things like hard coded. I, I was, all right. I know, I'm off of that box. It is 15 minutes to the hour. I've got about 15 minutes left. And I wanted to show you what I was working on this weekend because it came with some learning opportunities. And I'm going to, I just loaded it onto my personal developer instance. At Knowledge, at CreatorCon, we are going to be doing, I mentioned we're going to be doing live tech now sessions. We've done these in the past. And they've been mostly instructional, informational, how to build an application, how to do service portal widgets, that sort of thing, which is fine. I'm all about that. But I thought this year we're going to have a little fun. This year we're going to play a game and we are going to be playing Jeopardy. We're going to be playing service now Jeopardy. And I thought, well, there's two ways I can do this. One is there is, there is a website called Jeopardy Labs that has boards pre-built that you can populate. And I said, well, that, that's not as much fun. I think we could build a Jeopardy game. And I think some of the people there would, uh, in, in ServiceNow land, would find this useful and entertaining that we could do that. So I built a Jeopardy game. I started around Christmas, I think, building the data model. And in my Jeopardy application, I have games. There's, there's, I'm going to walk you through the data model real quick so you can understand. We have games, and each game has a set of categories. Of course, you know, when you see the game, they, they, they always tell you what the categories are at the beginning. There are a lot of nuances of this game, which made it an interesting application to write. So Please Release Me is all about what's in this ServiceNow release or what released it had this feature. The fossil record is the history of ServiceNow in the box or features that are available in the box, out of the box, whatever you want to call it. Maybe it's the reverse of in the box. Security badges are security related questions. WTF is what's that feature? Stay clean. And O really is a random selection of totally not related questions. There are more categories, but that's what I lined up. So the presentation, everybody's familiar with the Jeopardy board. It's got the categories across the top. It's got your dollar values underneath. And when you click one of those, it comes up with a card. And I called these cards. They state them in the form of the answer, and you have to state your response in the form of a question. That's the Jeopardy rules if you haven't played this game before or seen it on TV. I also have players. I am, right now, these are records that simply have a reference field, and I'm considering making this a many-to-many. -many. It is not the sysuser table. It is a completely separate table. I didn't want to have to register every user in sysuser for this but I wanted the player information to be separate and distinct. There was really no point in linking it to sysuser on this one because I didn't have that much sysuser information and I also had unique information to this use case that meant players don't really, you know, but I'd like a player to repeat. I thought of this last night and I went, hmm, maybe Michael's going to be playing multiple games. Right now I have it set up where Michael plays one game and his winnings are only tallied for that game. But if you had somebody coming back as a regular winner, if you wanted to replicate the true Jeopardy experience, you could have your champion returning each day or each week or whatever. Maybe you want to play this internally with your developers and have their winnings over time. You could have the game winnings, but you could also have their grand total. So I need to make a many-to-many -many table between player and game and move some of this information over to that many-to-many -many table. That's, that's coming up. But where we are right now is very simple. Uh, I can list them as a primary player or a backup. This was for my benefit at Knowledge in case I had to have a few people in the wings and say, hey, you're the backup at 12 o'clock. Can you be there? Uh, in case somebody sh can't show, which often happens. Things come up. People get sick. The control checkbox is really which one of these players has control of the board. I'll show that to you on the board. So the, I didn't use the image. I don't know where I was going to put it, but... I didn't. Uh, because of the fact that we don't have the technology like Jeopardy to put up their winnings on a board and sign in their name and let them do touchpad answers, uh, we do have the uh, 
smashable buttons to find out who responded first. You get a kick out of what we came up with for that. But uh, there are some limitations on what we can do in the game. And then, of course, the cards that correspond to those questions. They all have an answer. They all have a question. They have a difficulty level. So it determines where they get placed on the board, a state, whether they're available, queued, answered, or unanswered. Because somebody, you may get a question that is completely unanswered. Let's take a look at the experience, and I'll walk you through how I did this. So I, I have two entry points. One is the Jeopardy Home, which brings up another tab, and it says, here are your three games. And I created a simple table widget that you can click anywhere on the row. Take a look at service portal configuration, and I will show you how that looks. I thought I had service portal on here. I do not have service portal configuration on here as a favorite. I do now. So service portal configuration, go into my widget editor, and we will start right at the top with the Jeopardy home. Simple table widget, the server script. Let's get the client script and HTML out of there for just a sec. Very simple, goes through and builds an array. Here's a list, go through the game records, get all the ones where state is pending, query. Shouldn't look too surprising to any of you if you've done simple glide record queries before. I create an object with the name, the date, the ID. Then I have a script include that does a lot of the back end dirty work for this. It says, fine, given this game, go get the players. Who are the players in this game? Gets the records off of that related list, very easy, returns those in a in a, an array of objects, and then I store those into the uh, players array of this object and pop that into the list. That becomes data list. Now, anything in the data object is available to the client script and to the HTML. So if we put the server script away and jump over to the HTML, it's a simple rendering of a table. Okay, I put a div at the top for ServiceNow Jeopardy. That's what you saw here. Nice and big and corporate green. I also have a table that's using bootstrap classes, table and table hover. But I also threw in another class here just because that black background made the table look a little funky. I added some CSS that just says, Make my table background white. So you can see that on the other screen. The title rows, name, date, and players. Then I use some AngularJS stuff, ng repeat, game in data.list. So it says for each row, that's how I set up the data structure as an array of objects. Remember, list was an array, and then I was populating an object in the while loop. So each of those comes out as an object. And I can reference game.name and game.date but game.players is an array in that object. So it's got more information. I can do an ng repeat player in game players. So I don't go back to data.game. data.list. whatever it was. I also have the ng click up here. This is how I made the whole row clickable. And I said, great, whatever you want to do, go load the game if somebody clicks somewhere on this row. Originally, I had it as just a hyperlink on the game name. So this was an href up here, an ahref. If you've done HTML, you know what I'm talking about. Simple link. But I thought, eh, nah, someone's going to miss. Let's make it as easy as possible. This is my widget. I get to make the rules. So there's an ng repeat within an ng repeat. That was kind of cool. Hadn't done that before. A lot of fun. The client script then looks like this. It only has one function in here. It says scope.loadgame. That's what's called by the ng click from the passes in the sys ID of that, and I do a window.open on this. And you know, it's not a full URL. I don't have the host name in there. I don't even have the portal in there. So originally, maybe I wanted to say Jeopardy. Yeah. Apparently, I'm not in the right scope, so I can't edit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine. I'm just doing a demonstration anyway. So that's, uh, that's the home widget. When you click that, wherever it went, it brings up the board. And of course, the board is too big because I have this font set for this show. And I've got my players across the top. Then the categories on this table. The hardest part about this, as always, is the CSS. Is how do you get this darn table layout? So this is <laughs> sort of next level stuff because I am passing some information all over the place. And I want to show you one 
quick feature. I think I'm going to have to finish this spotlight on this tomorrow. But what I did, I, I, I realized we'll continue the experience and then we'll get into the technical stuff tomorrow. How's that? When you click a card, let's say, please release me for 100. Okay. I have stats on the players up here. So I know who's in control. Michael, you have control of the board. That was also reflected back on the board because Michael is green and he's got the check mark. I can quickly glance. Michael, you have the board. So he gets to pick the topic. Whoever's in control. When you click the card, I can still see that. I know that everybody's got zero dollars here. If they get the question right, I click the thumbs up. Let's say Michael answers this correctly. And the card is now out of play. And he says, all right, Michael's still in control. I'll take please release me for $200. And if he guesses it wrong, the thumbs down. But it doesn't return to the card because somebody else could guess the right answer. So one of these has a window dot open and one of them does not. Now, if nobody guesses it right, I can always use this icon to mark it as unanswered. And the card is now out of play. Nobody got any money for that. I have the score at the top. I think you heard that, right? That was that was audio in the service portal. So I uploaded an MP3. I'll get to that tomorrow. And now this amount is editable. So Michael only has $100. Even though it's a daily double, he can only bid up to $100. He bids $100. Then click the image. And there's the, there's the question. Now you're asking, where's the answer? How does the host know the answer? So what I did is I built, I used the mobile app, the standard legacy. This is all done in London. Standard legacy app. And I brought up the records and I built a mobile UI action. I mean, you can see it right there, but in the list, it says host display. And the host display brings me up a simple service portal widget. Now it says game one, but watch what happens when I click the, see if I can hold that close up, click say the fossil record for a hundred. I have the question and the answer. So this is effectively Alex Trebek's cardboard cards that he holds up with the question and answer. So I don't have to expose that. If I do, if somebody wants to see, the answer was in fact, where's San Diego, California, right? So you can see it with this little show and hide here. Lots of stuff going on on this widget. This is one of the more sophisticated ones because it has to, <laughs> of course, post that back here. And this updates in real time. This is my favorite part. This was what I thought of yesterday and how I'm going to execute this. If I go to security badges for 100, boom, it just updated the host's prompt. If I go to another one and say, let's take, what's that feature for 300? Ding, it tells you in real time. So that was, uh, that was one of the more clever things that I, uh, I thought of yesterday. And the rest of the game pretty much plays out like you would expect. I'm going to keep testing this, keep rebuilding. And of course, yes, on game one, I have a script that resets the game back to all players have zero money. The board is reset. Michael's back in control. All the cards are back in play so I can test this over and over. So that is what we will be playing. I will make the app and the sample questions that I've got here available on GitHub. I'll make those available, but it probably won't be till at or after knowledge, because obviously the answers are in here and I don't want everybody with the answers. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll distribute the app. Uh, I'll probably make a video that goes along with this, put this on the share portal as an update set and in GitHub. So this is all going to be available. I'll get into the technical, how I did a lot of this stuff uh, tomorrow. When you say we talk about that tomorrow, how's that for a teaser? So. Could be used for testing, could be used for education. Just a fun way to learn things. I think it's a, it's, it's a vehicle that a lot of people already understand. I'll tell you, the hardest part is just coming up with the questions and answers and what categories. So for that, you'll like this. As I come up with the questions and answers, as I try to spell Jeopardy, I have a pivot table report that tells me, can I make a category out of this? Because you need five questions per category and you need six categories. So if I were to come up with a game four right now, I couldn't. I see I have one, two, three, four, five. These are my difficulty levels. They help calculate the value. 
Difficulty one is $100 on regular Jeopardy. There is an option to do double Jeopardy, at which point it will be $200. So all the dollar values on the table double automatically if you're playing double Jeopardy, if you set your game to be a double Jeopardy game. We have 30 minutes, probably won't get to a double Jeopardy game. But I have one, I need, I need a complete row of one, two, three, four, fives. I could make two games that have O'Reilly, but I really don't have one, two, three. I only have three categories that have at least one question in each of those levels. So using a little bit of reporting, I now know where do I need to fill in the thin spots. If I want to do please release me, I need another level four question about something that was released in service now to use that category again in another game. So lots of the, the experience of building the game could still use a little work, but since I'm the only one building them right now and probably limited audience anyway, it's really just paying attention to your related lists at this point. Um, but there is chance for human error. Like what if you put in three level four questions and no level fives? It's like, okay, they, it could happen, but the board won't draw right. So that's, that's where we're going with that. That has been a lot of fun. I appreciate you hanging out with me for a while. I will show you how I built a lot of that stuff tomorrow as we go come back and do the community again. Thanks for hanging out. It's been a lot of fun. If Again, if you found something useful, helpful, entertaining in this video, mark the like button on the YouTube video or check the helpful link in the community. And I will see you again here tomorrow. Take care, learn something, share something, be helpful because that's what's going to say on the next screen. Bye. <laughs>